Hi, I am Ali Camaletti, and you are listening to Snack Leadership. I will be talking about everything leadership, broken down into bite-sized pieces. You will hear what different leadership skills look like in organizations and how they can rise teams up or take them down. I help leaders build resilience and improve performance by bringing awareness to opportunity behaviors in my business, spark your mindset. I provide leadership and sales coaching, as well as team building and guest speaking. My hope is for you to feel inspiration and to create a spark in your mindset. Hi, everyone. Today, we are talking about perfectionism. Perfectionism is the refusal to accept any standard short of perfect. Oh yeah, it's such a big topic for so many. For me, it has been one of the, I'd say the biggest aha moments in my life was understanding what perfectionism was doing in my life in not a really positive way. And it took me a while to figure this out. I have really been a perfectionist, I would say, half of my life, if not more. And the challenging part of this, which I'll talk a little bit more about, is that for me, it worked to my benefit. I was able to really show myself as a great employee because of my levels of perfectionism. I'll always remember this manager I worked for, and one day he said to me, Allie, you know what? I can't believe that you actually think about what needs to be done and finish it before I have even asked about the idea of it. He goes, I've never experienced that with anyone before. And I was so proud of myself. I said, heck yeah. Well, I kept that in my mind for a very long time that that is how to be an amazing manager back then in my 20s, early 20s, was to be perfect at everything. I would make good money. I would succeed. I would climb the ladder. And so I just dug into it. And I was a total perfectionist in everything I did in my work. And it fed me. I felt valued. I felt recognized because of it. Well, then... What ended up happening is I went on to have my own business. Now, different, I wasn't having somebody above me always tell me that I was doing this amazing job, but instead I had clients and I was doing event planning in the first business I had. And so what this looked like is I was really well known for the events that I was involved in because they were super smooth. I had this crazy, intense timeline that I would give vendors. And I'd always put in there, you know, it's okay that we don't run by the minute with this, but it's nice to have a flow of what we're shooting for. I can guarantee you, there were some vendors that I probably worked with that they were like, is this gal for real? Are you kidding me? Look at this timesheet, because I literally had it down to the minute. But that is how I process, is I plan things out like that in order to make sure that everything comes off smoothly. And absolutely, there were days that things did not, and we ebbed and flow. I mean, hey, when it comes to the golden light in wedding planning, you make sure that that bride and groom, they're out there getting their pictures right then. We do not stick to the timeline for stuff like that. And there's stuff that you just can't expect, like... The rabbi's running late. Well, everything's going to shift by about 30 minutes in that situation. But in the end, I'll never forget when I was dissolving my business at the time and I was moving on. And I will say, I had the opportunity to sell it, but I didn't sell it because our town is small in Bend, Oregon, where I'm from. And I didn't want anybody to... mm, not do things how I would have done them. And that business had my name on it. So there you go. Good example of perfectionism. But going back to, I remember talking with a company because I also did some fundraising events. And she said to me, she goes, Allie, 
I don't understand why you are stopping doing this. You're so good at it. And I was like, yeah, and now it's time to be good at something else because I had burnt myself out. They say the lifetime of an event planner is three years usually. Yeah, I had done event planning for nine years at that point. And if you can only imagine the levels of perfectionism that I was holding myself to with all of those events, it was not healthy for me. I burned out good. It took me a while before I could really even attend events. So perfectionism is something that it took me a while to figure out. And I'll say when I first figured it out was my journey with infertility. And I wanted to control the living out of getting pregnant. And I thought I could. And boy, I tell you what, I did. Some of you know my Machu Picchu story where I literally in Peru touched every fertility piece of rock that I could find on that trip. And I came back pregnant. And my doctor was like, this isn't possible. I was like, I don't know. It says I'm pregnant. Well, it didn't stick, which happens. And that really is where I started my journey of understanding perfectionism for me. And I couldn't control what I wanted to control so bad and make so perfect, which was being able to carry a child. It was not in the cards for me. And so what really changed for me is I read Brene Brown's book, The Gifts of Imperfection. Not too long ago, Clark Twitty asked me, he said, Allie, what's your favorite Brene Brown book? And I was like, oh, without a doubt, it's The Gifts of Imperfection. And I said, because it changed my life in a way that affects every single thing I do every day. So just recently, she did the 10-year anniversary of The Gifts of Imperfection, called Let Go of Who You Think You're Supposed to Be and Embrace Who You Are. And boy, that speaks to it. I was striving for approval from my parents for so long. I was going to prove to them my worth. Well, it ended up proving that I got really burned out and it wasn't healthy. Now, one of the things that Brene Brown did is she went on and did podcasts with her sisters where they focused on this book. And if you haven't listened to them, I encourage you to do so. They're really interesting. The other awesome thing she did is she has a website, and it'll be in the show notes, where it's called The Wholehearted Inventory. And it's actually to gauge your levels of perfectionism. I recently took this and I remember looking at the results and I'm like, oh, I've been doing good because I tell you what, I call myself a recovering perfectionist because it's constant mindfulness that I focus on perfectionism and really making sure (laughs) that I have tamed that. So Harvard Business Review put out an article, How to Manage Your Perfectionism. And of course, I was intrigued. Perfectionism is a double-edged sword, they say. On one hand, it can motivate you to perform at a high level and deliver top quality work, right? That was me back in the day. On the other hand, it can cause you unnecessary anxiety and slow you down. I do have anxiety tendencies, and I will say it comes from my perfectionism. I completely see that. How can you harness the positives of your perfectionism while mitigating the negatives? What measures or practices can you use to keep your perfectionism in check should you enlist the help of others? They go on to talk about what experts say. A lot of perfectionistic tendencies are rooted in fear and insecurity. Absolutely. I was trying to prove myself. Fear that I wasn't good enough and total insecurity when I was younger. The online coaching services of Matt Plummer helps workers become more productive. Many perfectionists worry that if they let go of their meticulous and conscientiousness... It'll hurt their performance and standing. Yes, I struggle with that sometimes. But I'm mindful of knowing what's best and healthiest for me. 
And so what happens is they cling to their perfectionism, even when it's counterproductive. If this describes you, take heart. Reigning in your perfectionist propensities is not as hard as it sounds. It's about rechanneling a strength of yours rather than aiming for a lower goal. Your aim is to take some of the pressure off yourself, says Alice Boys, a former clinic psychologist and author of the Healthy Mind Toolkit and Anxiety Toolkit. Of course, that's easier said than done, but the fact remains, if you genuinely want to be a high achiever, you're bound to do some things imperfectly. Here are some ideas on how to let go of your perfectionism. See the big picture. As any perfectionist will tell you, being perfect isn't easy. Your diligence takes a lot of effort and your attention to detail is incredibly time consuming, says Plummer. Of course, as a perfectionist, you're never going to aim for merely adequate, nor should you, but you must also recognize the opportunity cost and time of your behavior. Asking yourself, am I using my time wisely? Am I being productive? He recommends focusing on maximizing the impact of your work. You can spend an extra three hours making a presentation perfect, but does that improve the impact for the client of your organization? I know I get hung up on that. I do a lot of slide decks and I will be looking for the best photo as the background. And sometimes I'm like, let it go, Allie. Maybe the slide doesn't even need a photo. So it's shifting your mindset. You're going to be less perfect about some things so you can concentrate on what's important. Okay, I'm going to apply this to being a mother. The big picture is I want to set my daughter up for success. If I am a perfectionist, it will roll right into her. She is like a little sponge right now and she will also become a perfectionist. I do not want this for her. I do not want her to have to repeat what I went through. And I know that it can come out in other unhealthy ways for her, which I am very aware of. So you know what? My house is not as clean as it used to be. And I am totally okay with that. Because the big picture is, it allows me to show my daughter, it's okay to have things a little messy. It is. And I get to spend that time with her instead of, constantly cleaning all the time. So adjust your standards. Managing your perfectionism also requires you to calibrate your standards, says Plummer. For example, you're grinding out an important memo for your organization. He suggests showing your efforts to a colleague or supervisor early in the process. You may discover it's already good enough. And that task you thought could take 10 hours could really only take five. Don't be shy or embarrassed. It's your first draft. And even if you need to continue to work on it, the feedback you receive will help you improve. Keep in mind, too, that this memo needn't be worthy of a Pulitzer. What you're saying doesn't have to be the final word. It just has to contribute something useful. Create a checklist. I thought this was really interesting. So the pursuit of perfection is a bit like wandering on an aimless journey. You keep walking and walking, but you're not sure that you're getting any closer to your destination, he says. Similarly, a perfectionist is always going to want to keep working on an achievement, but the end result is rarely satisfying. So rather than toil in search of this goal of perfection, he recommends creating a checklist for each task. For instance, you're working on an important client pitch. The perfectionist in you might fret over the front choice and sweat every semicolon, but with a checklist that reminds you to confirm your spelling things correctly and to eliminate basic editing errors, you need an endlessly slog. You're following a process with discrete and measurable goals. Once you've ticked off the items on your list, you're done. Brave the cycle of rumination. Many perfectionists tend to ruminate, repetitively mulling over a thought or a problem without ever coming to a resolution. It's related to anxiety. And I will say, recently I was like, God, I'm feeling really anxious. What in the heck is going on? And I was noticing, yeah, I'm feeling a little more stressed. My life balance has been a little out of sorts. Business is getting busy again. I'm juggling being a single parent. 
giving myself grace. So people who ruminate tend to be less forgiving of themselves, right? I'm being forgiving. It's unhealthy and it's unproductive. Don't confuse ruminating with problem solving. Instead, look for ways to disrupt the cycle. So the first is identify your triggers. Conquering this habit is to learn to recognize when you're ruminating. Figure out what sets you off. Make note of the situation where you are, the time of day, and who's around. Find your consistent patterns. Then think about ways you might steer clear of or control those factors. Don't trust your first reaction. If you're dwelling on a past event, such as an interaction with a colleague, be cautious. You might not have an accurate read of the situation, says Boyce. When you ruminate, you tend to focus on all the bad things, she says, so you can't trust what your ruminating mind is telling you. Try hard to get perspective and give yourself time and distance before taking action. You might be blowing it out of proportion. Seek a diversion. Distractions are useful. They talk about like, if you find that you're doing this, go and do something that's just mindless. And as a self-employed person, I will do this. Like, for example, writing articles sometimes. Not my favorite thing to do. And it really takes me out of my comfort zone because I don't feel like I'm this great writer. And so I will break it up in chunks. And then I'll go do something that is just really mindless in my work, like tracking my hours for a client or doing something like that. The next thing is think positive. Ruminating often leads to avoidance of certain tasks. Notes, boys. There's a feeling of, if I can't do it perfectly, I won't bother. To combat this idea, she recommends reflecting on times in your past when you tried something new. Think about the successes you have had. By reminding yourself of the pathways that led you to your accomplishments, you'll be able to see that you achieved a meaningful outcome despite not being 100% certain of the success. This helps you learn from your experiences, she says. So get perspective. You may find it helpful to have somebody hold you accountable and monitor your progress when it comes to your perfectionism. Tell them that you're working on it. Overall, things to remember. What you should do. Learn to recognize the point of diminishing returns when you're aiming to complete a task perfectly. Sometimes just getting it done is a worthy goal. Reflect on your progress. Identify examples of when you successfully moderate your perfectionism tendencies. Calibrate your standards. Oftentimes, what you're writing or saying doesn't have to be the final word. It just has to contribute something useful. Things not to do. Mistake ruminating for problem solving. When your mind is twisting and turning, seek out distractions to break the cycle. Toil in pursuit of a goal of perfection. Create a checklist that ensures you follow a process with measurable targets. Go it alone. Ask others, a trusted colleague, friend, or mentor for perspective and support. The rest of this article has some case studies that I recommend you read and review. They can be really helpful. The link will be in the show notes. So I leave you with, when perfectionism is driving us, shame is riding shotgun, and fear is that annoying backseat driver by Brene Brown. Thank you for tuning in to Snack Leadership. I hope you felt inspiration, motivation, and felt your mindset spark. Snack Leadership is recorded and produced by myself, Ali Camaletti, and music by Shireen Amini.